Welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is CMO 70s CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. Deep T. Pandita. Dr. Pandita is Chief Medical Information Officer at UCI Health, the only safety net academic medical center, and also a level one adult and pediatric trauma center in Orange County. Dr. Pandita is board certified in internal medicine and clinical informatics. She was previously CHIO and program director of clinical informatics fellowship at Hennepin Healthcare in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dr. Pandita, deep tea, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm delighted to be here. Well, we are delighted that you could take some time off today from your super busy schedule to be with us. Your journey into healthcare is one that I would describe as completely multifaceted and inspiring. I really wanted to dig into a bit of the backstory and understand your foundations. What initially drew you to healthcare and internal medicine? And then how did that passion evolve into taking such significant leadership roles so early in your career? Yeah, thank you uh, for asking that question. So again, it was a very sort of organic evolution. I think I was always interested in health sciences, even in high school and as an undergrad. What drew me to health sciences was basically how things work. I think I was always curious about that. And I grew up actually in India. I did not grow up here. And we actually had zero exposure to computers or anything like that. So it sort of, some of it was sort of chosen for me because the options available, if you were interested in health sciences, was typically, you know, you became a nurse or a doctor. And uh, I chose the doctor route, did my medical school, uh, and fast forward, I came to the United States to do my residency in internal medicine. And why I picked internal oh. medicine was I was very curious about whole person care. So how the human body works instead of being interested in just one organ or you know, one uh, one system. So again, that, that sort of gives you an insight into how my mind works. I always like the big picture. And that's why I picked internal medicine. And as I was evolving in internal medicine, even during residency, I got my first exposure to technology in terms of using computers and things like that and got very interested in that. I didn't, didn't even know that informatics was a field at that time. But, you know, I'm, I'm mostly what I call an accidental informaticist and mostly self-taught uh, in that field. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I had actually heard the story back when you were in residence, you know, first time looking at a computer. And I think that's so amazing because where you are today, you've really blossomed in this field of informatics. I'm curious, how did that happen? So you were, you're a resident and you kind of got into the EMR for the first time or, or what was the story there? Actually, I, I will be dating myself, but I got, there was no EMRs at that time. Right. We had paper records, but we would, we were just starting to use computers for things like, um, you know, charting some notes or, you know, word documents, things like that. And my co-resident and I said, why is our on, why are we carrying all these pieces of paper and why are we creating these large, you know, documents for our on-call scheduling? We had heard about Excel and we said, okay, why don't we develop an on-call schedule on Excel? And then we did that and we had a central computer in our, you know, resident lounge and everyone could, you know, get the schedule off of that. And then our next step was creating a handoff report. We said, okay, everything that you do for a patient by, by teams, we will organize it into these folders, create a handoff report and then puts what happened to the patient. And then when the new team comes in, they read their support and so all pieces of paper that are often outdated and God forbid, do you carry the wrong paper? Then it's telling you information that's two days old. So that's sort of my first foray into what I today call, you know, workflow analysis, designing for, you know, people and informatics in general. And then lo and behold, as soon as I was finishing residency and joining my first job was the time that we were implementing EMRs. And everyone was hating it. They were like, this is getting into my, you know, space. And, you know, it's a third wheel and I'm not liking it. And I was loving it. Sure. I was like, give me more. I like this point and click system. I mean, the, I mean, these were rudimentary beginner EMRs, but I was embracing it. And my, and my um, department chair came to me and said, you are different. I mean, everyone's complaining and you are saying that you like it. Go teach your colleagues. So that was my first foray into sort of what we would call a super user or a, a you know, a physician trainer or whatever you want to call it. 
And then that led to other things and then eventually more leadership in that uh, area of informatics. Today's episode is brought to you by DeepScribe, AI clinical documentation that physicians and health systems love, documenting specialty and complex care with ease and precision. Josh, have you heard all the buzz around ambient AI and virtual scribes? Definitely. Clinicians are spending hours a day on documentation, so improving their day-to-day and reducing burnout is huge right now. You know, you and I have seen quite a few product demos for Ambient this year, but I have to say, DeepScribe was one of the most impressive. Well, Josh, you trained as a clinician. What stood out to you most about DeepScribe? Well, using AI to transcribe and summarize the clinician-patient conversation is honestly table stakes right now. But a big challenge for CMIOs and CIOs is driving actual clinician adoption. So what really impressed me about DeepScribe is how well it can be customized to different specialties and workflows with dozens of templates as starting points. You know, that would be critical to me as a clinician because I just don't have time to build templates from scratch. So true. For me, I was particularly impressed by the auditable notes. You can highlight any part of the note and then DeepScribe shows you exactly where in the transcript the note was generated from. So you can find that evidence right away. That builds trust. Oh, exactly. You know, being able to confirm that something wasn't hallucinated is so important for clinician trust and safety. Yeah. That same attention to detail that led to really high clinician adoption is also resulting with clinicians saving up to 75% of documentation time. Wow, that's incredible. But how is DeepScribe's accuracy with specialty care or complex cases. That's the best part. DeepScribe's proprietary LLM, Keel AI, is trained on over 3 million patient conversations. It's then further tuned by specialty and subspecialty cases, making it way more accurate than GPT-4-based solutions. Pair that accuracy with DeepScribe's customization studio to personalize the experience for different clinician preferences and workflows, and it becomes incredibly flexible. You know, Alan, speaking of flexibility, I could use some yoga myself. Flexibility is key when it comes to working with health systems with so many moving parts. DeepScribe sounds fantastic. Where can health systems learn more? About your yoga? I don't think they want to. But about DeepScribe? Check out DeepScribe.ai. That's DeepScribe.ai to learn more. It, it, it's funny. I think, you know, one lesson from your, your journey there is that to kind of figure out what's meant for us, like look at the things that frustrate everyone else, but we just so happen to love. And if you can find that intersection, like maybe there's something there for you. It sounds like, you know, technology informatics was exactly that. All your peers hated it. You were the outlier who loved it. There's something there. I'm curious, like when you look at kind of your your younger rising colleagues today, I think folks now get into medicine a lot more acquainted with technology, right? I mean, kids now are like using iPhones when they're, you know, three years old and whatnot. Are you finding that your your younger colleagues are a lot more kind of technology inclined? And, and kind of actually, they or, or do, they, do they all hate the EMR still, anyways? Yes, and 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 that is that is something that is so curious to me because you would think that the you know today's residents, medical students, or you know new hires that we have, even as faculty, they would be embracing the EMR because this is second nature to them. I mean, they are glued to their phones, their devices, you know, computers all the time. Well, that is actually not the case. <laughs> they hate it just as much and mainly because I think, one, we are very remiss in not having an education on informatics, <laughs> even in medical school or residency. I mean, they don't know how much the people process technology matters. I mean, they, they we are so focused on telling them disease and evolution of disease and treatment of disease that they don't learn that actual decision support and however they are interacting with the patient has a, a computer component. Uh, and so they fail to understand that. And that is why they start hating it because they are like, this is just getting in my way. You yeah. know, I want to see more, do more, create more. And yet, you know, I have to sort of administer it through this system. Um, and so I think it's not because they're not tech savvy. It's because we are not teaching them the value that the tech is bringing. And I think to your point, definitely in the first years of medical school, we were mostly in class and it's didactic. Informatics technology is not coming up at all. And so you're just hoping that they get some good exposure during their clinical training, but but they might not. You know, that makes yes. total sense. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, at my last job, one of my passion projects, and, and we are actually presenting this shortly at some national meetings, is was to create an emerging program in informatics for residents. And we started with just a small pilot with, you know, a cohort of four or five residents. It became so popular and it grew so much that eventually all residency programs said, okay, we are going to offer it to all residents. And then instead of being an elective, it became like 
a, a, a mandatory thing. So right. all residents in their three years had to do this four week immersion at least once through informatics. And we developed a you know didactic curriculum. We had them work on a project. We had them do workflow analysis. You know all of that. And so I, I would I I hope and wish that more programs do this because I think that gives these people who are our future workforce an insight into what goes into an EMR or creating mm. an EMR or running an EMR or even developing solutions using an EMR. You know what all is involved in that. That's amazing. Hey, can I just ask you? I mean, four weeks is not a lot of time. I'm curious, like, what are like the one or two most important like lessons you hope uh, a, a trainee will take away from that? Um, you know, four weeks. So I again, you know, we had a super dedicated curriculum around the four weeks, but the key takeaways were one that there is a whole <laughs> workforce behind the scenes that is involved. So when you are complaining and say, "Oh, I wish you know my EMR would do this." And then you put into that ticket, what happens after that? Mm. There is a whole process. There's a governance process. There is a resource process. There is a, you know, how does that ticketing process even work? What are the tools you're using for that? So just giving an insight into, and then behind the scenes, there is security yeah. analysis that needs to happen. Cybersecurity is important. Applications, what applications do we have in our suite? So if they can there, just take away that knowledge about the process piece and how technology is not, we deliver it seamlessly and that's a good thing. You see that part, but you just peel the onion and look at what not, what all it takes on the backside. Yeah. That alone gives you a whole new appreciation of how technology works. Amazing. Yeah. I love that idea. It's also just, you know, illustrating what the system is like and revealing, like really peeling their eyes back to take, uh, take on that whole view of what the system's like. You mentioned at the top of the podcast that you were driven to internal medicine because you wanted to get a, a better look at the entire system, the holistic view of a patient as opposed to really just microscopic on one organ or another. I'm curious how that's translated over to your work in healthcare IT. Has there been a, the same kind of perspective that you have when you're looking at informatics as you did as an internist? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so again, you know, that whole person care concept can be very easily translated into informatics. I mean, you're not, when someone comes in and says, you know, can you help me do this? Then you have to go back to the drawing board and ask them, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And when you understand the problem, you come at it from, is this a problem just for you? Or is this a problem for your entire division or department? Is this a problem that affects just the physician or, just, or nurses, front desk, everyone affected? You know, so once you start, looking at every ask from that, you know, sort of reverse engineering to look at, is this just a pain point that this one person and is it because they have a gap in training and that's why they're having this pain point? Or is it actually a part of a symptom of a bigger problem? Yeah. And then once you look at it, and if it is indeed a symptom of a bigger problem, then it's a whole different design process. Then if it's just one person problem, a pet team where you might just give them some app that will support or, you know, some training resources to solve for that. So taking a look in terms of sort of, you know, do I, I mean, I'm, I could come from a very lean sort of background. So the first question I ask is, do I have a problem? And if the answer is yes, do I know root cause? And then you sort of go down that path and then design the solution. It, it reminds me, so like right now, obviously AI has been a big buzzword the past year. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of AI being a hammer looking for a nail to hit in the healthcare system. But I, I totally agree with you that you always want to ask, well, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Do we even need AI to solve that? What's the right way to, to do it? Uh, I'm kind of curious, like right now, lately with, let's say, clinician well-being, we're hearing a lot about as as a real priority to fix. And so for a lot of folks, like Ambien is a little hang fruit maybe and whatnot. And those seem to be what everyone else is doing. And so maybe it's easy to kind of gravitate towards what we have to do what everyone else is doing, or do you step back and say, hey, maybe that's not the best way to solve that at UCI. I'm, I'm curious how you look at the say clinician well-being and balance that with figuring out, well, what's the problem to solve here? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I uh, worked with the researcher who developed the mini-Z score for clinician burnout. So I'm very, very mm. well familiar with the work, national work that has been done around clinician burnout. I think the question of well-being we sort of assume a lot of answers. 
So the first question is, do you know root cause for your well-being issues? You know, there is a lot of assumptions there that documentation burden is the root cause or in basket is the root yeah. cause, you know, things like that. But I think when I am talking to a group of physicians or even, you know, a department or a division chair, or when they bring up that my clinicians are burned out and it's documentation burden, have we measured that, you know, yeah. because data is powerful. So the first step I will typically take is look at our clinician well-being surveys. We also participate in class surveys. We participate in doing an annual well-being analysis internally, our press gaining surveys. So I put all that together and then I point out to the clinician or the clinician group saying that actually, you know, you are saying your department is burnt out because of documentation burden, but you are actually one of the most proficient departments mm -hmm. in the area of documentation. And by the way, the clinician who's bringing this up as a burden is actually not as burden as these two other clinicians in your area, because I have the data to show mm -hmm. that who don't even ever have the time to complain. So maybe they need resources and this one does. So again, you have to arm yourself with data to see if it's truly a problem. And then if it is a problem, then look at the solutions. And yes, I totally agree. You know, ambient is becoming state of art and coming up repeatedly as an ask. And we are also piloting an ambient solution. We are also using ChatGPT for in-basket management. And all those things help, but they are not truly getting to the heart of burnout. The burnout yeah. in the clinician community actually, and, and uh, you know, we have data on this. We can blame everything in the EMR and burnout, but if you go to the well-being questions and ask them, they will say that the root cause of burnout is they're not feeling appreciated, they're mm. feeling like a cog in the wheel and not having autonomy over their, you know, workspace and, uh, you know, their uh, scheduling and chaos in the workspace, you know, not having clarity about roles, responsibilities, things like that. Those are more likely to be issues on burnout. Now, those are very hard to solve. Mm. And that's why we sort of try always to solve for the lower hanging fruit, which is documentation and in basket and all of that, because there are solutions around that. But I don't think those solutions will get to solving everything that we need to do to solve the bigger problem of well-being. <laughs> I love that. I, I think to your point, it's almost like clinician well-being has multiple root causes that contribute to the challenges there. And so even if technology solves some of it, you can't solve all of it, but but you're trying to make some debt in, yes. the, in the ways that you can, then that, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that I think we've found in, in your work in the past is you've had this philosophy around designing with people, not for people. Um, what does that, that mean to you? And then practically speaking, how do you actually you know use that in, in your work with technology? Yeah, so I I actually did not have this sort of philosophy going into informatics. I mean, I, will, I was always of the thing that if someone has a problem, you go create a solution for it. But then as I developed more in my leadership realm, uh, I started realizing, and I had a few aha moments around this, which I can quote, but is that, you know, you cannot create solutions in a silo. And again, that big picture, the whole, whole person view is important, but what you need to do is understand why there is a problem and who are you creating the solution for. So as an example, we were sort of uh, doing a groundbreaking for a new clinic, which was for postpartum moms who were coming in for seeking, you know, uh, treatment for depression and postpartum issues and things like that. So this clinic, which is a mental health clinic, was totally geared to that. And so when we are doing the design process and creating the architecture, you know, one person said, oh, these are moms and, you know, they have, you know, they're, they are overwhelmed and depressed. We should have mood lighting. We should have a real calm space, calming music, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, all these things. And I'm like, yes, of course we need that. And then we got this group of people and, you know, someone suggested, hey, why don't we just ask the moms, you know, what they want? And we got this group of people in the room and we said, you know, we are thinking this and this is the prototype and all that. And they said, None of this matters because when I come in, I need an area for my other kid to play and I need someone to babysit the other kid. And what I need is transportation to come to this appointment. I mean, I was working in a safety net system and I, I want to make sure that, you know, when I am done here, 
my medications are delivered to me. I mean, none of that mood lighting and, you know, having beverages and all of that mattered to them. All they wanted was, will I be able to keep this appointment, make this appointment while my other family members can be taken care of? So, you know, go back to the drawing board. We had to reset the entire process. Same thing. We were, when, you know, during an EMR implementation, we were setting up our MyChart portal and we were setting up, okay, what do patients want to see? So they want labs and they want this and this should be the order of the tabs. And then we take, took it to a patient partner council and they vetoed everything. They said, I don't want to see any of this. All I want to see is, when is my appointment? Will I get an alert when it's time for my appointment? Can I do wayfinding using the portal? And then will it tell me when what my other appointments are and how far apart they are so I can time myself if I have to get from building A to building B? It was a game changer. I mean, you know, you, you have to sort of think, put yourself in that person's place and then design. It goes back to like the first principles of just talk to your actual users. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it so, sounds easy, but it's certainly not always the easiest to do. Definitely not. So, Deep D, I, I had a question. You brought up the patient councils and, and patient um, panels that you put together. Do you have any tips on how to form the ideal patient panel? I, I think you should never pick patients who are your favorite patients from your own practice yes. <laughs> because they will always, you know, be your. Uh, you know, your uh, sort of advocates and, you know, agree with you. So I think you should pick a diverse population of patients. And and typically most organizations have, a, you know, a patient engagement committee or a department or whatever, and they, they know these patients. So pick someone who has complained about billing. Pick someone who had a recent hospital stay and was not pleased. Uh, you know, pick someone who is a repeated patient. Pick someone who is perhaps end of life and knows it and knows, and, yeah. you know, is dealing with those things. So I think you have to pick a very diverse patient population. Make sure they are, truly represent the communities that you are serving. That is very important because the patients on the patient council have to be those that come from your surrounding communities from those cultures and can speak to, you know, culturally appropriate care and things like that, which you may not think of. And, you know, again, make sure that you are engaging them. So not doing lip service, but actually listening actively and engaging them and then, you know, keeping them engaged through the process, no, no matter what you're using them for, but keeping them engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to think that bringing them in and providing lunch was enough, but, you know, talking to them that actually doesn't matter to them. What matters to them is when they see the solution and they contributed to it, that yeah. gives them a sense of pride. Today's episode is brought to you by Seamless MD, which enables health systems to digitize patient care journeys, leading to lower lengths of stay, readmissions, and costs. Josh, you used to be a doctor. Did you ever feel like patients showed up unprepared for surgery? Or maybe you felt like you were sending patients into a black hole after discharge? All the time. You know, we give patients paper and verbal instructions, which are so easy to forget and really hard to follow. And we have no idea what happens to them outside the hospital. So what happens? Well, because we worry about them, we keep patients in hospital longer, but that drives up length of stay and lowers throughput. Plus, after they leave, patients get readmitted for infections and all kinds of problems that we could have just caught earlier if we monitored patients. What if I told you there was a way to give every patient a virtual companion so you could automatically engage and monitor them through a surgery, a cancer journey, or a chronic care journey, and drop the length of stay, increase throughput, and lower readmissions? Gosh, Alan, that would be amazing. So that is exactly what Seamless MD does. It allows health systems to engage patients on their own phone, tablet, or computer with automated reminders, education, and symptom monitoring. Basically a GPS through any healthcare journey. That sounds fantastic, but does it actually work? It does. Health systems have done over 40 studies and evaluations showing how they use the solution to reduce length of stay by one to two days, readmissions by up to 89%, and costs by over $1,000 per patient. Huh, but how does that work with my EHR? That's the best part. Seamless MD is the only solution in this space with direct integration partnerships with Epic and MyChart, Oracle Cerner, and Meditech. Huh. Well, you know, I am getting a colonoscopy soon, so I really need something like this. Where can my health system learn more? Well, Josh, thanks for letting me know. Your health is very important, and endoscopy is just one out of the 50-plus out-of-the-box care plans available today on Seamless MD. Go to www.seamless.md. That's www.seamless.md to learn more. Can I ask you, um, especially the last couple of years as health systems have been you know, very much in financial recovery, 
everything, including technology, comes under more scrutiny around ROI, ROI, ROI. And there's, I think there's certain technologies where the ROI is more obvious and quick. So let's say you, you know, for implementing online self-scheduling for the first time, you get more patients booked, you can see the impact on the bottom line very clearly. But if you invest in solutions that improve, you know, patient well-being, like let's say it was something like Ambient potentially, seeing the impact of that on retention, for example, that's a much further down the road, you know, outcome. And it may be hard to, to tie in that that connection um, between the solution and and retention. So how do you think about communicating ROI when sometimes it may not be as clear cut as something like online scheduling? So the, uh, the ROI piece is, uh, you know, it's tricky and it you have to speak the language that your CFO wants you to speak or your CIO wants you to speak. It is not just in terms of cost saving. So, you know, I could implement Ambien and it saves the physician 20 minutes a day which could translate into, you know, one appointment. So say the cost of the ambient technology per license per provider per month is 400 and I'm freeing up 20 minutes to see one extra patient. It pays for itself, you know. So yes, that is one way to show the math, but I refrain from doing it that way, mainly because I don't want to be saying that my physician can see one more patient. I mean, that's not good for their well-being. I would rather say they go home on time and spend that time with their, you know, family. So how I frame it is in terms of cost avoidance. And cost avoidance is basically that physician is happier. They contribute more to community and the healthcare system. They are excited to come to work and that way you're retaining them. And when you're retaining a physician, the cost avoidance of not having to recruit annually always keeps going up. So you do the math in those terms rather than saying, oh, there is an ROI today because we implement this technology and you can see one, one more patient. Did you ever think that how you use technology in informatics could ever be a differentiator for how you recruit clinicians? Like, do you ever think there's going to be a point where someone says, oh, hey... It, 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 yeah. is, it is already a differentiator. <laughs> it is. I mean, you know, we, we have physicians, you know, I, I sit in interviews and they ask, you know, which EMR do you use? And if it's not their preferred EMR, they will not, you know, uh, join sometimes. Or, or they say, you know, do I have tools in addition to just the EMR to do my job? Like, you know, dictation software, you know, am ambient or whatever we are using. Do I have a dedicated, you know, so if, if we are recruiting someone who's also interested in research, do I have research support staff or analytics through the EMR? Or, you know, can I do self-service analytics in your EMR? So these tools and technology solutions are already out there, visible, and physicians are asking for it. Incredible. So DP, I was curious, back to the point that you made about putting together the patient panels and making sure that there's a diverse group of patients, diversity of opinion. I was also curious that same framework and how you think about your pilots and pilot testing. So, and you can use Ambient as an example, but I'm curious, do you just give it to the people who are raising their hands and they want to try the pilots or what's your approach to choosing the right people to put your pilots together? Yeah, the, the great question. So my approach is again, you know, you know, as an informaticist, go to the data. So, you know, we get our EMR data on who, which departments or which people within departments are struggling with documentation. You know, they're spending, you know, after hours time or their documentation is not streamlined or they're not able to see enough patients because of the documentation burden or they're not closing, you know, visits on time and that has a financial implication. So I go to the data and then I see if there are patterns in the data. So if it's like a whole department is struggling, then it's an obvious no-brainer that this whole department gets the solution. But if it is certain two, three people within a department, and then I go talk to them and say, you know, why is this? And they tell me it's because they see the highest volume of patients, or it could be they like to spend most face-to-face -face time with patients. Then I might do the pilot in terms of, okay, we pick five departments that have, you know, people who are struggling with documentation, and then we do a diverse pilot across the five departments. But if it's an entire department that is struggling, then I might just do the pilot in that department and have a control group from another department. Right. So again, it's the data that drives that decision making. Right. So it's not just, you know, if they're tech savvy or if they're raising their hands or- Oh, no, no, no. In fact, in fact, I'll tell you, tech savvy people are seldom struggling with documentation. So they're right. not probably <laughs> the right uh, people to, I mean, for myself even, 
you know, I, I am always closing my goggles on time and, you know, it's not a problem. I mean, whether I type or dictate or whatever. So I would be the wrong target audience for a solution because it's no matter what the solution is, I'm, I'm always going to be proficient Thank because you. I know the EMR so well. You know, there was a, a study that came out earlier this year around Kaiser Permanente's initial experience with, with Ambient. And I think at, at about the six week mark, they saw adoption plateau at about 38% of clinicians using Ambient regularly. And I was kind of curious how you think about success from an adoption point of view. Because I'd imagine if it was 1% adoption, it's like probably not worth it. But 38%, maybe that's kind of borderline. Um, I'm curious, like, how do you think about adoption so that it's good enough that this is worth kind of sustaining the long term? Because I think part of it too is, to your point, not every question needs or may want something like Ambient, for example. But what's yeah. good enough? Yes, everyone thinks that they need it, but then when you actually present it to them and how it works and all of that, a lot of people actually are turned away. You know, they're like, "Oh, this is not for me. It's not in my workflow, or I cannot." I mean, you know, you. I mean, I have a very busy physician who asked for an ambient solution. And once I demoed how it works, you know, he said, it won't work for me because I go from room to room to room and then I do my documentation. Whereas for ambient, you have to do it in real time and things. Mm -hmm. And he said, that one won't work for me. So yeah. even though he thought he needed it, it actually was not the right solution. So again, it depends. I would say 38% is probably a little on the low side because again, you have to give clinicians a variety of tools. You know, some are just good typers. There is always, you know, smart data things you can do within the EMR to say, you know, this streamlines your documentation. Speech to text is still around and some like that, and that's totally fine. There's a lot of templated stuff that people can do. So for example, you know, if, if you're in a very niche specialty, you're doing the same repetitive stuff, case after case, templating works just fine. So it all depends on the need. Any of these documented solutions are never one size fits all. And I'm not surprised at the 38% because people who are proficient will continue to be proficient no matter what tool they use. You know, it's it's just one other tool in the toolkit of documentation. So I got to yeah. ask, DT, are you still clinically active today? And so what's you, are you using Ambient or? I, I just started using Ambient. You know, like I said, we just started a pilot. So I've been using it for what, two, three weeks now. And it works. It's good. I mean, I'm not, I have no doubt about it. And I'm actually surprised how well patients take to it because you have to give, ask for consent and, you know, right. say I'm recording. And I, I have never had a patient who has said no. So it, it, it's good from that standpoint. It's fairly accurate. I would say there are some areas that, you know, need improvement, but in terms of it does not have language barriers or, you know, multiple people talking and all that. It seems to work yeah. well from that standpoint. So it can actually pick up different languages and- It can pick up different languages, awesome. yes. Very now cool. the game changer would be if, say, I speak the patient's preferred language. And so we, you know, just say I'm Spanish speaking and the patient's Spanish speaking and the whole conversation takes us, takes place in Spanish and the note could be generated in English. Right. Now that would be- an, you know, really good. And at the same time, the patient's instructions are generated in Spanish. Mm -hmm. That would be good. I mean, I think that's really where, from a health equity standpoint, these tools would be really valuable. Yeah, in true and personalized. I think, I think they can be used in that manner. It's just going to take some time to evolve into that. Right. And yeah. Can I ask you, and I, I'm sorry for asking so much about Ambient. It's just such an interesting topic right now. Um, there's so many solutions that have come out. There's more popping up that I didn't even realize existed. And there's still folks online talking a lot about how it's eventually, eventually going to be a commoditized, you know, module or product. I'm curious, like when you, you don't have to name names, but when you were looking at different options, did you really notice a difference or what sort of differentiators did you decide, you know, mattered most to UCI when you were kind of considering your options? So they, they all seem similar on the surface. And yeah. It's not quite clear to me what matters. I mean, again, they're all based on generative AI. So I think the technology is very universal. It's yeah. how the technology is implemented into the tool that might differ a little bit and how much actual machine learning went into it behind the scenes. So that sort of creates a differentiator. So there could be ones that were studied, say, only in niche departments, you know, orthopedics or pain or something like that. And obviously then they are very well developed in that area, but doesn't so well work so well in, say, family medicine where their patient has 20 different problems, you know. So 
And those are things that need to be done. Or on, for example, the exam section, you have to be narrating, you know, the exam right. in order for the AI to pick it up. And certain um, departments, like I have a pain specialist who does a lot of very specialized musculoskeletal evaluation. And uh, the AI is not able to pick those up because yeah. that is such a specialized area. So it just depends. Whereas some products are very good at that because they did have, you know, contributions from that special specialty into the machine learning algorithms. And some did not. And they created more of a generic sort of product. Mm -hmm. Most of these products are, again, very ambulatory centric. Very few work across, oh. you know, the continuum of care. So if I wanted to use it in... ED to inpatient to ambulatory to virtual care to the whole you know spectrum. Very few of them actually work across. I think uh, they'll get there, um, but predominantly today they are ambulatory tools. And I'm guessing the ideal end state would be that everything in the room is internet connected and, and ambient related. So that, for example, instead of having to speak into your smartphone that I'm I'm auscultating the lungs and here's what I hear, the stethoscope would just be internet connected. The data is passively being recorded. You don't even have to say it out loud. Like that would be the eventual end state where uh, all the I technology would take is it a, hidden. Yes. And I would take it a step further. I think we should have camera vision in all the rooms. So I don't even have to do that step. I mean, you know, the camera vision will pick that up. I mean, we do that today for falls and, you know, assessments and things mm -hmm. in patient rooms. We could do the same for the patient physician interaction. I think to your earlier point, even if we do all of that, that still won't solve clinician well-being issues. <laughs> no, because the pressure of see more, do more right. on the physician is not going to go away. And none of these tools can take that away. Yeah, absolutely. So, Deepti, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. You hosted a brilliant panel presentation this year at HIMSS 24, highlighting various digital leaders, their unique journeys, and the priorities of the app today, many of which we've talked about today, uh, like Ambient. You've also been involved with ACP and AMIA and the other HIMS HIIMS for a number of years. I'm curious, why are these activities and societies and groups important to you? <laughs> so I, I think, you know, uh, again, innovation cannot happen in a silo. And we are all trying to innovate and do the best for our communities and our, our patients and for, you know, society in general. But again, learning from others is important. And each of these professional societies lends itself in a different way to enrich me professionally, but then for, for me to then translate that learning to my team, to my communities, to my users, I think there is a lot of power in that. And that's why I continue to stay engaged with all these professional societies because I learn so much from my peers at all of these places. Yeah. And then kind of a follow-up to that, kind of bridging two different things that we've talked about so far in the podcast, but is there a plan for an informatics-specific fellowship at UCI or? We do have one. We okay. already have an informatics fellowship. Awesome. Um, yes. Th um, that's still uncommon though, right? I don't think that many organizations actually, are... Actually, it's growing. So when, uh, when I started my prior informatics fellowship in Minnesota, it was the first in the state and now there are two. So it's growing. We were uh, one of like 14 programs at that point, and now there are 51 programs. So it's growing, but it's not growing enough in my view. Okay. Eventually for board certification and clinical informatics fellowship will be the only pathway starting 2025. Right. And I think that's when uh, more and more people will start, you know, going the fellowship route. Sorry, what's that difference in 2025 exactly? So right now there is a grandfathering in process. So for example, when I took my board certification, I was the first batch when board certification was offered. It was based on experience in informatics and education in informatics and things like that. That process is ending next year. So now you will require a fellowship in order to be eligible to take the, the clinical informatics boards. Do you ever think that informatics and technology would be such a large you know, thing that you may even need to have a, a separate residency program? Like, do you, do you ever see it happening where I'm going to go into residency and become a CMIO, or is that too crazy of a, of a thought at this point? I don't know. And I'm, you know, we, we sort of think of informatics as synonymous with CMIO, but there are so many other things mm -hmm. you can do with informatics. I mean, I think 
the CMIO path is just one path. And and to be honest, I mean, with the number of people in informatics growing, not everyone can be a CMIO. But there are so many other things. I mean, there is the device industry is exploding. AI, as you said, is, you know, being used more and more, and we need informaticists to drive that. The regulatory side, you need informatics a lot. I mean, FDA, ONC, you know, CMS, they all need informatics. So I think the value of being trained in it goes beyond just the CMIO sort of structure mm. and goes beyond the walls of healthcare, actually. It's very true. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, Deepti, one last question that I had for you. Empowering future leaders, especially women in tech, really appears to be a significant part of your ethos. And so I'm curious how you view the role of mentorship and education in shaping the next generation of all these informaticists out there and healthcare IT leaders in general. If you had to give maybe napkin advice, what would you share? I would say don't hesitate to seek out mentors. Mainly because if you don't, it's only to your disadvantage. Okay. You know, what will happen at the most, that person will say no. But I have had so much enrichment in my life by just cold calling, reaching out, approaching people at conferences to say, hey, you know, can I pick your brain on something? Or will you be uh, willing to mentor me on, you know, this topic that you have done so much uh, work on? And And you never know where that lands you. I mean, you... Beyond the mentorship, I found, you know, value in developing lifelong friendships with these people and you learn from that. So I would say if I had one advice to give, it would be never hesitate just because you fear rejection, you know, just re reach out to people. Yeah, I love that. Amazing. So Deep Deep, just being mindful of your time, we're going to flip over to the fast five lightning round. So this is just okay. five rapid fire questions for you. The first question we have is what is your favorite book? or book you've gifted the most? Uh, and this is a gift I give all my leadership new hires, uh, which is Patients Come Second. It is uh, a book about leading change in healthcare. And as you know, informatics is everything about change management. So okay. I love that book. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very interesting title. Yeah, I, I had looked that one up. <laughs> well, it, grabs you, it grabs your attention. Certainly. It does. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Question two, who is a person, either dead or alive, who you'd love to meet? Oh my God. Uh, I, I think Steve Jobs comes to mind. Me. I, I mean, it would have been so fascinating to just get into his mind and see how he thinks about, you know, design and application and everything in general. It makes you wonder what products would we have today with Apple if he were still around? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very true. Question three, would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? I would say yeah. read people's mind, mainly because as a physician, I've seen enough people who are not able to speak for themselves, advocate mm. for themselves, and you know all of that. So it would be fascinating to read people's minds. Yeah, I really love that perspective on that. I've never like that's awesome. Now, what if you couldn't turn that power off? That's our follow-up uh, question to that one. Can you? Can you? So, again? so imagine you're now reading people's minds, but you can never turn that power off. So, you're... oh my God, uh, that would be scary <laughs> to some extent. You know, it would, it would, it would be a lot of responsibility, actually. Yeah. You know, because if you're reading people's minds all the time, and then you, you find out that you know they're distressed or you know they're not expressing no. themselves adequately, I think that would be a lot of pressure on, yeah, um, putting on oneself in terms of how do I solve for this? You know, because again, at the heart of it. I'm a problem solver. Yeah. That, that's probably the most empathetic answer that we've is. had to that follow-up question, Alec. Totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. Most people just like, oh, like, that's so annoying. But you're like, oh, I'd be worried about people. I'm like, oh, that's yeah, so, that, that's yeah, great. Yeah. You know, everyone's well-being is important. So. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even such an empathetic answer, just to choose reading people's minds in the first place, the reasons why you would do that is from a place of empathy. I really love that. Question four, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? Oh my God. You know, when you get into the whole topic of how middleman and insurance and all that drives the cost of healthcare, people have no clue. Right. I mean, they don't understand the business of healthcare. They understand the service aspect of healthcare and that's what comes across. But even in my own like physician community, I'm sorry to say, the understanding of the business of healthcare is dismal. Yeah. And and people really, you know, of you know, their eyes like go wide open and they just cannot fathom 
the amount of complexity in the business of healthcare. Yeah, certainly. Question five, last question. If you could travel back in time to any event or moment, what would it be and why? Oh, I have to say it would be the Renaissance era because oh. the amount of innovation and in technology that was going on during that time it would be fascinating how they were thinking about it. Mm. Yeah, that would be. I don't know if we've ever had a Renaissance era for an answer. I'd love we, that. We get, we get a lot of uh, going back to when, uh, you know, humans landed on the moon. I think that's probably the most common yeah. one we've got it. But not the Renaissance just yet. I don't think. Yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, again, you know, I have been to Renaissance Fest, so you that right. tells you, you know, my <laughs> mindset. So, yeah, but, so, so again, fascinated from that. But I, I also love your appreciation for the technology and the technological advances that came from that era. I think, yeah, that's because if you read the history of the machine, it tells you that the most rapid innovation in machine happened during Renaissance era. Right. And that makes you think that. There must have been a bunch of very, you know, light thinkers and also people who were sort of thinking differently than yeah. others at that time. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that is amazing. Deepti, Dr. Pandita, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing your wisdom with our audience and, and myself and Josh. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. You can find Deepti on X or Twitter at MDDeepti, D-E-E-P-T-I. And that's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient, hosted by SeamlessMD. You can follow us on Twitter at SeamlessMD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, visit www.seamless.md. Uh, Dr. Pandita, again, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.